Uh, I was asked by uh, Laszlo to talk about some off-label cases, um, you know, where imaging uh, was helpful in addition to just clinical judgment. And so I'll just uh, do some, uh, you know, show and tell. But before we get into that, wanted to just uh, update you all and those joining in um, remotely on um, the list of participating hospitals for the Stroke Coalition in the Tri-County. Uh, just briefly go over the data collection variables. So Niels Mueller, myself, Peter Antevi, uh, Ralph Sacco, and uh, some of the other folks from UM. Uh, we were on a conference call last week uh, to discuss, uh, you know, uh, the some of the granular data we'd like to collect uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, metrics that confer quality, uh, including outcomes. And um, Jose Romano, for those of you who were at the Stroke Symposium this weekend, um, uh, really uh, made an impressive presentation on, uh, you know, what these regional dashboards will look like. So I have some slides on uh, those. And um, then we'll get into cases. So. Here, the updated list of the uh, hospitals participating in the Florida Puerto Rico Stroke Registry. So if you're participating in this, then by default, you're already in get with the guidelines and entering data into the comprehensive tab. So if your hospital is not up there, then again, ask your administrations to get on board with, uh, you know, uh, participation. Um, come 2018, the dashboards will be uh, unblinded to EMS medical directors. The way that's going to work is, um, you know, by region, the, it's not the UM group uh, that's going to unblind any of this data. It's going to be, you know, on a volunteer basis and by request of the EMS medical directors. So just to keep any, you know, uh, politics or any of that out of the out of this uh, momentum. So basically, this year, the dashboards I'll show you are from first quarter um, 2017, so January to March. And so the UM group will continue to develop more of those dashboards each quarter of this year and share, you know, with the hospitals that are participating to, you know, start to get an idea of where your hospital is in terms of quality compared to those in the region. And then in 2018, so April of 2018, is when EMS medical directors can go to the hospitals where they uh, triage patients to and say, uh, you know, uh, can we see your data? And so it's really up to those hospitals to volunteer that information uh, to the medical directors in order to uh, better get sense of quality of care regionally. So. This is all a lot of text, but I'll just kind of, um, you know, highlight the data that's going to be collected as part of, uh, you know, from the Florida Puerto Rico Registry and reported in the regional blinded dashboards. So we segmented into ischemic volume, hemorrhagic volume, because we know that that's important in terms of, uh, you know, uh, kind of indicating quality of care, how bigger the volume potentially the more experience a center has with TPA and thrombectomy, and uh, then better the likelihood of good outcomes. Low volume centers, i.e. those do, that do less than 25 thrombectomies a year, or give TPA probably half a dozen times a year, probably not going to have as good as times or outcomes as those that have high volumes, uh, based on the literature. Um, IV TPA uh, treatment rates, so percentage of TPA administered overall, as well as those uh, you know who arrive by three and a half hour treated by four and a half hour, meaning you know the in the extended time window, um, the 90 day MRS for treated patients, both for TPA and thrombectomy, and then for thrombectomy, what we're looking at is uh, just the overall uh, you know uh, treatment rate for LVO. So uh, then segmented out into you know thrombectomy. Uh, for those, um, you know, last known well, less than six hours, anterior circulation, posterior circulation, those treated with NA stroke scale score six or greater, and even less than six. And then the median door to groin times for those subset of patients. 
And the reason we kind of, um, you know, categorized it by this is because we know that, you know, uh, these are the patients, anterior circulation, last known well less than six hours, and the A6 or higher are the ones that fall squarely into the current guidelines. And so that's where we want to make sure hospitals are acting quickly, moving quickly, and, uh, you know, door to groin times ideally uh, less than 60, 70 minutes, um, if not better. And then uh, median onset to groin times. Uh, this is the information that is still a little bit more challenging to get from the field, especially for patients coming via EMS. Um, you know, I know there's apps like Pulsera and others, but we really need a concerted way to figure out what the uh, field pickup times as well as onset times were. So the more information that's available from these EMS agencies uh, bringing patients to the hospital, uh, the better in terms of, uh, you know, uh, having a sense of, um, you know, not just the in-hospital process, but uh, from field to puncture. Um, what else? Uh, so in terms of the outcomes, I'll cover that in a separate slide, uh, mainly because, uh, you know, that's the one area that's still missing a lot of data from this first quarter. And so I think there's an area of improvement and have some, um, you know, tips on how to make that better. In terms of the symptomatic uh, intracerebral hemorrhage rates, um, uh, so basically, you know, the way uh, you want to identify patients who not just had a hemorrhage, like a little bit of PTO hemorrhage or hemorrhagic conversion, uh, and more importantly, who were symptomatic, is have an internal way within your hospitals to, you know, meet on a regular basis to, before the data goes in to get with the guidelines, to say, okay, review scan by scan with your stroke medical director or your neurologist or your interventionalist, and say, uh, okay, is this hemorrhage defined as symptomatic based on anti stroke scale four or higher? And, you know, the actual region of the hemorrhage, um, you know, is it hemorrhage due to just sheer size of the stroke and then have hemorrhagic conversion? Um, is it an instance where, um, you know, there's stroke, a little bit of particular hemorrhage, maybe a, a pH one, and, uh, but the NI stroke scale increased because of the actual mass effect from the stroke. So it takes, uh, you know, the input of the clinician as well as potentially the radiologist in your hospital or the interventionalist to figure out which are going to be categorized as SICH um, at 36 hours. So, you know, uh, if you don't have a rigorous process in, in your hospital to actually meet on a routine basis, we meet on a monthly basis for QI, review every scan where patients have hemorrhages. Mm. If you don't have that, my concern is you're going to overestimate the number of actual symptomatic hemorrhages, and then uh, you know, make the system look worse than it really might be. Okay, you might be doing a great job, and you're probably not having those complications and TPA hemorrhages. Um, but you know, if you don't have a way, an oversight committee to actually review scan by scan, patient by patient, then your QI person may not know how to accurately categorize the hemorrhage as symptomatic or not. So, any questions about that? Does that make sense? Dr. Mueller and I, we were discussing that on the conference call, and you know, he's encountered a similar issue within some of his hospitals, and so kind of, you know, went over what we do at Memorial. Perhaps we can learn from other hospitals what your oversight, uh, you know, sort of QI committees are, how you review your cases, um, because it, it's easy. I'll give you an example. You know, at Memorial West, uh, Joy, who's here, um, a year ago, it looked like uh, for our intervention cases, you know, TPA and or thrombectomy, uh, the hemorrhage rate was like 12%. We were like, how can that be? You know, because anecdotally, I knew the cases I had done, my partner had done, and then the cases we have given TPA to, that we didn't have that many symptomatic hemorrhages. So then when we looked at it scan by scan, and we realized that it was just some particular hemorrhage here or there, but you know that was not the explanation for the patient's neurological deterioration. It was generally the size of the stroke, the lack of response from the treatment. So it's very important to be involved in that process. <coughs>
So in fact, our SICH rate, correct me if I'm wrong, was like, you know, it was, yeah, <laughs> zero. So we went over scans and we're like, okay, yeah, I remember this case. There was a huge stroke, there was mass effect, and it was just a trace amount of blood in there and it got categorized based on that as a symptomatic intracerebral hybrid. So let's go over the regional dashboards. So <coughs> this is, uh, I don't know if you guys want to turn the lights down, uh, if you guys can see. So these are all hospitals just in Broward County. They're blinded. And you can see um, the hemorrhagic volume, achievement volume, number of TPA administrations for fourth quarter 2017. And you know, uh, you guys may know which is your hospital. None of us have an idea. This was all blinded by Dr. Sacco's group. And so only he has the codes. So you can see there's variability in terms of volume for ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke, as well as TPA treatment rates. And then next slide is the door to needle times. So at the bottom, what they've done is, uh, ah, here we go. So at the bottom, what they've done is, They've listed Broward County and Florida as a whole, and same thing here. So the hospitals, when you see this data, you can benchmark yourself against the county and uh, statewide. So we're actually doing fairly well countywide for door to needle, median time of 34 minutes. And you can see by hospital what the ranges are, as low as 26 minutes and as high as 62 minutes. And then door to groin puncture time, is also not you know uh, too shabby. You can see here, Broward County, the median door to puncture is 63 minutes. As a state, it's 97 minutes. <coughs> and you can see by hospital what it is. So this hospital is 215 minutes. This one is on um, you know 70 minutes, 70 minutes, 96 minutes, and 37 minutes. So you know. You can then uh, go back to your case volume and you know cross-reference it to your uh, you know actual treatment rates as well as your performance metrics for door to needle, door to puncture, and so this is the type of information really that's I think in the link going to be useful for hospitals to identify you know areas they might be lagging and continue to improve. And these are just global metrics. Over time, we can provide more granular data, like door to picture, picture to puncture, puncture to reperfusion, if you wish. Um, and, you know that is going to be available to you all in the Florida Puerto Rico registry. Um, this is just to provide a more global view, you know, by hospital. And the one thing that right now is missing from most of these hospitals uh, is. The, what is the discharge modified ranking score and the 90 day MRS? And so, you know, just like having a committee to review hemorrhages and classify them as symptomatic or non symptomatic, um, we want to have the same set type of effort put into collecting outcomes because you have metrics of one thing, um, you know, showing good outcomes is the most important, right, uh, thing for. The region and for the medical directors, the EMS medical directors. So, the information that we really want from every hospital is, you know, a percentage of treated patients where the discharge MRS was collected, and percentage of treated patients meaning where the 90-day MRS was collected. And so, if you internally find, and we're doing our own review at Memorial for this. If we find that we're only collecting discharge MRS on 20% right now, well, we got, it's only May, so we have the rest of the year to get our act together and say, look, we're gonna train our nurses, we're gonna you know, do all of these things, such as implement an EPIC or whatever EHR you have, um, you know, a MRS uh, entry module. So no matter who's actually doing the scale at the bedside upon discharge, it's as standardized and uh, avoid variability as much as possible. And then ensure a 90 day follow up. So, you know, in the uh, discharge summary, we say, you know, please call us if you don't hear from us by, you know, in three months. 
generally, we, if they're local, we plug them in with uh, our neurologist so that they follow up within a month after, after discharge and then at which point they get a, another reminder that please call us in two more months for the 90 day uh, MRS. And you know, ideally we want to see them in clinic at the three month visit. If clinic visit is not possible, then phone call is used as a backup. So currently we're training our nurses uh, on the stroke unit and uh, our stroke NP is already trained uh, so that uh, we can collect discharge MRS on every patient that gets intervention. And then um, we have a stroke clinic where they get the 90 day follow up. So I think every it's paramount that every hospital collect this information. I mean, this is you know sort of the basic rudimentary information that we need in order to assess quality of care. Questions? Okay. Um, I do have a question. Yeah. I know that uh, you know the the committee, the the star chamber you guys put together on this, and I'm behind it. I I, I agree with what you're doing. But uh, I know, uh, based on earlier talks, some of this stuff is weighted. Am I am I correct or incorrect? What do you mean? Well, like so, like this ter the, the territories. Are you putting weight on that kind of stuff? Uh, volume or percentage of volume on ACA versus MCA versus PCA because of the. No, right now we just look at data just as it is in this more basic form. Right. You know, anterior circulation, posterior circulation, what are the, you know, uh, patients, how many patients got mechanical thrombectomy, yeah. and what are the outcomes. Okay. There's no weight assigned to any of it. Oh, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I was just curious. So, because, you know, some of it might, such as posterior circulation, might have a whole different door to groin time than anterior circulation, as it perhaps should, because yeah. it requires maybe additional imaging, discussion with family, intubation, if they're not, if it's a basilar occlusion, they're just uptunded. So, you know, obviously think, those are process independent. And I think every CSC in Broward it has a completely different demographic of, of who they're treating. Yes. I think it's fair to say. And so, you know, one of the goals of doing these series is to at least get some folks on board uh, with who are the patients we should all treat, right? Yeah. Which are the anterior circulation, ICA, M1, proximal M2, and uh, within six hours, NIH six or higher. I mean, that's by ASA guidelines. Um, I'm gonna talk about some of these off-label cases so that, uh, you know, together as a group, we can also have discussions about are these cases also appropriate to treat and you know, perhaps we should be more aggressive beyond just the guidelines because we know mechanical thrombectomy can be beneficial, as we've seen anecdotally. And in the Don trial, you know, with wake up strokes and in the last thing normal done with advanced imaging. So, um, there, these are just a few of the examples that. Uh, when I went through our database the last couple of days, I identified, you know, in terms of kind of, you know, a true off-label cases if you were to look at the current guidelines. And so I'd appreciate your input, see what you would do uh, as I talk about it uh, before we kind of go to the results. So the first one is ICA pseudo occlusion. And so this is a patient uh, just from a few days ago and you can see here, she had a complete, what looked like on CT angiogram, occlusion of the ICA. And so she had, you know, dense symptoms. So right gaze, left hemiplegia, neglect, and literally, uh, you know, last seen well within the hour, okay? And so I've seen this now a bunch of times, and it, it, a paper just came out, I'll show you on ICA pseudo-occlusions by uh, the Emory group in stroke. And um, what they found is, you know, a good number of times, it, what this is, you know, uh, typically read as a dissection, a claim sign, is not. In fact, it's just a collapse of the entire vessel because of the ICA terminus occlusion. Um, and especially if the clot extends from the terminus down to the pecan or even the ophthalmic, as I saw in a case two weeks ago, if you have no outflow, 
the whole vessel collapses, you're scanning the CTA up and down the source images. And you know, uh, two years ago, I would have asked myself, dang, the whole ICA looks out. Am I gonna take this patient for thrombectomy? What if more clot goes to the brain, right? But this patient without treatment, uh, you know, would have done terrible. So we give them a chance. We do know that ICA pseudo occlusions like this, as the Nagara group showed, do have worse outcomes than the other types of LVOs. So when I took the patient to the lab, and even the radiologist called me and said, uh, just want to let you know there's a dissection here. And I said, you know what? Most likely, probably not a dissection, because when you, I looked up at the CTA source images, there was some retrograde flow here that you could appreciate through the PCOM and the ophthalmic suggesting that, in fact, this was all just collapsed vessel. So when I did my initial roadmap and run, I would, you know, did a really strong injection, and you can see that the IC filled very slowly. I mean, you can literally see, as I'm sure Lazo and others in the room have seen, the contrast just kind of tracked up. So I'm on the floral pedal for like 10 seconds until you can you know, uh, stop seeing any more contrast uh, integrated. And so we did, uh, you know, one pass from Bethany and got everything open. The patient did reasonably well. So, you know, this was, uh, and we had, when we were doing the Don trial, had a case like this that I actually excluded from Don because at that point, unknowingly, I thought, you know, the radiologist is reading, it's a dissection. If you have an extracranial issue with the carotid, those patients get excluded from Don. But when I took the patient to Angio, I realized when I did my injection that this was just a pure ICA terminus occlusion and we could have included the patient in the trial. And I was kidding myself for that. But um, this is the paper, so cervical carotid pseudo-occlusion and false dissections. So intracranial occlusion is masquerading as extracranial occlusion. So that case fits perfectly. What they found when they identified all instances in their cohort, you know, cervical ICA pseudo occlusions occurred in 46% of patients. So when the radiologist read it as a possible dissection, in fact, it was a pseudo occlusion due to a terminus lesion in half the patients. And what they did find is these patients tend to have, despite reperfusion, worse outcomes because, you know, they virtually, if the PCOM at the level of, you know, the PCOM, you're out, and let's say sometimes these patients have fetal PCAs, then they virtually have no collaterals, especially if it's a true T occlusion. So here's the example from the paper. So very similar to the case we had a couple of days ago. It looks like a plain sign, classic dissection. But then when they did their initial injection, you can see here that, you know, it's just uh, occlusion uh, past the ophthalmic segment. So it is, uh, you know, I think a pretty compelling study. So any questions about that? Okay. So now I'm very aggressive with all of these types of pseudo occlusions. What look like, you know, collapse of the whole vessel, I always take them to angio to see indeed if it's a true you know, ICAT versus is it an ICA origin occlusion that you need to stand open in order to get up there. So here's another case and... Can, can I have a question? <coughs> yes. And my question is, uh, then what's the difference? Because if the carotid is proximally occluded, we do the case. Yeah. If the carotid is distally occluded, we do the case. Sure. The only thing is that you do this angiogram and you see this weird uh, layering yeah. of the contrast in the carotid artery, then you know that it's not proximal, but distally occluded. So yeah. it, it, uh, I hope that um, in the Don trial, in that particular patient, when you said uh, he, was, he or she was excluded from the study, you actually did it. Yeah, so we actually treated that patient and thankfully she had a good outcome. But what I've learned is these are the worst case scenarios. When you have an ICAT and it looks like a pseudo occlusion, these patients tend not to do as well as, say, your proximal M1 or you know uh, uh, an ICAT, where they still have a decent amount of flow. It you know, basically it means that it completely interrupts the circle of this. Correct. And then there is no flow in the ACA, in the MCA, and in the PCOM. Right. So everything is up. Yeah. And the instances where I've seen these patients do okay 
is when it's not a pseudo occlusion, it's an isolated ICAT, and they tend to have a prominent uh, PCA, a PCOM. So either a fetal PCA or a, you know, just a, a, a PCOM that is at least salvaging a lot of the tissue, you know, in a retrograde pleo collateral form. So, but I, every reason to be aggressive in these cases. So here's the next one. So this is a guy we had last week. He's a 67 year old and, you know, unknown symptom onset time, he was found down at home. And so we took him straight to CT and, you know, overall the CT aspect score was favorable. He came in with neglect, uh, severe hemiparesis on the left, not complete hemiplegia, and uh, he had some slurred speech, at, you know, his right MCA, so he was able to talk to us. And, um, you know, when we did the scan, we found this. Okay? So basically, you know, by all intents, yeah, an M2, perhaps even a distal M2 occlusion. Okay? So. The radiologist called and said, you know, uh, Brijesh, this clot looks fairly distal. Um, you sure you want to take him? And I said, well, clinically, the guy's acting like an M1. You know, he's hemiparetic, he's got neglect, and intermittently, he's preferring just to look at the right side. So I said, you know, look, the guy's 67. Let's give him a chance, right? What's the worst case scenario? It's actually two M2s. <laughs> so, here on the first run, you can see, you know, if you just look at this run, and I have a higher up image, but generally, you know, in order to keep the procedure time as short as possible, uh, my technique is do a single run pre-thrombectomy. So try to get a good image of cranial cervical and enough to navigate your devices. And then uh, the next one should be post-thrombectomy, right? So these are not perfect cases. I try not to collect beautiful images. If it happens, it happens, but most of the time it's, you know, uh, a rodeo show. So patients flailing all over the place, we don't sedate them, we don't intubate them. So uh, in this case, um, you know, it was tortuous, but we got the sentry past this, and I show you the lateral. So here's the lateral. So again, kind of like a pseudo occlusion case, you know, in order to better appreciate where the area of occlusion was, you stay on for about 10 seconds and see how much the peel collateral from ACA and the other M2 branches are filling, the superior division and some of the other inferior division. And you can, I don't know if you can appreciate here, the clot was sitting right there, okay? So it matched where we see it on CT and a parenchymal defect. So this was very reasonable to treat in my opinion. I don't know if opinions in the room would differ in terms of would you guys have treated this or not? Albeit outside the guidelines, but... Recently I was at the SNIS meeting uh, two weeks ago and uh, <coughs> uh, there was an equivocal opinion of everyone that would have treated these uh, M2 lesions if they are proximal yeah. and especially if they are on mostly the posterior M2, uh, the inferior, inferior posterior M2 branches on the left side with a uh, dominant left hemisphere. Yeah, absolutely. So I think these are definitely worth treating. And you can see here the stent treever. And, you know, again, uh, out of fellowship two and a half years ago, I would have, you know, hesitated going this far out. But the solitaire was able to get out there. And, you know, uh, once I was able to get the wire past this, and it was a little bit of a challenge getting the wire past that. But I just, let it flow and you know get into them three and four branch and so at least it, depending on what size stent treever I use you can have enough you know distal and proximal to the clot to you know prevent any emboli during retrieval. Is that a four by four do you are using that? Four forty. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So yeah I mean I, I agree I will definitely treat this and I've actually treated uh, lesions like even uh, more distinct than that. Um, do you guys have the mind frame or the capture uh, device like uh, on, on your shelves? Yeah, so we don't have it on the shelf, I don't think, but you know, uh, on the rare occasion, we use baby tree or mind frame to treat. My concern sometimes with chasing like an M3 is generally what we've seen at immediately post thrombectomy, you get the MRI, 
is that, uh, or even pre-procedure if I'm debating should I take this patient or not, is they've already infarcted that region matching the area of the occlusion, especially like a M3 branch. And so, unless they're aphasic, you know, and uh, have uh, debilitating weakness, I tend to be more conservative, uh, especially if the, you know, infarct is already evolving in that area, because then I worry about reperfusion injury. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. So, you know, I would treat those for aphasia, or for, you know, if it was uh, actually going to the motor cortex. Uh, I have a couple of uh, younger people who have done that, but uh, we usually get MRI, so we know what right. the tissue is uh, right before. Yeah. But uh, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. And sometimes, I mean, the reason that the mind frame can be helpful is you can you don't need to have like a, a larger micro uh, catheter to go further out with, yeah. with less risk. It can be helpful. So. Yeah, I mean, the devices that evolved and they're excellent. Um, you know, uh, there have been reports of you know, and not chasing clot that's in the superior division because of just the smaller caliber it is. And so I do tend to err on the side of getting more imaging. And if it screws up my metrics, it's okay because at least you've done your due diligence and making sure it's not harming the patient. The anterior division tends to be not only smaller, but more tortuous, uh, more difficult to navigate. Yeah. The uh, posterior division usually it's a big, if it's a dominant big angular branch, just like in your case, I assume it was. Uh, it, it's pretty straight up to the uh, Sylvian point, where it, you know turns out. Now uh, I didn't have too many uh, bleedings with uh, stent retrievers, but uh, I remember those uh, very well where I went too far, and those were really the M3 cases when I tried even a small uh, stent retriever and I tried to pull it back in a curve, it doesn't, yeah, you arteries don't like it. Yeah, so uh, so I, I tend to use uh, either just purely uh, uh, adapt technique or uh, in the past actually, not very recently, balloons. I can, I can put the hyperglide balloon that far and just massage the clot a little bit with the hyperglide and that's awesome. Yeah. <coughs> I bet, you know, chasing some of these spots like M2, M3, you know, an uh, incident last year of vessel perforation because, you know, the farther out you go, the, you know, this patient had intracranial lathro. And so I was still debating is this a, you know, an embolic versus just a stenotic ICAD and then it occluded. And so I was fighting with the micro wire, micro catheter, trying to get past the area of occlusion, and then end up deploying a stent retriever. And then, you know, after the run, I didn't see any active contrast extract, but when I got the CT, there was some miraculous hemorrhage. So, you know, you learn from each of these cases and try to improve your approach. So here's uh, the outcome of this patient. Um, you know, after I think we did three passes, and uh, this is the area you can see before was a parenchymal defect. And so he started improving, you know, thankfully on the table and uh, ended up being discharged home about four days later. So, you know, despite the CT showing this and the radiologist kind of questioning, you know, if I'm gonna go chase this, you know, what I tend to do after these cases is update the radiologist so that, you know, it's a multidisciplinary team, so they understand that, look, these are also cases that we ought to give patients a chance. Yeah, Richard, let me um, call it in your attention that we are, do, the topic is uh, a diag a CT or MR diagnosis. Yeah. So uh, let's not discuss too long with the therapy, great cases, but let's go for the, uh, for the CT diagnosis. Yeah, so here's, um, a, so this is data supporting treatment of M2 occlusions. So just as a reference. And so uh, this is a ACA occlusion. So this is where I feel like if I selected the patient based on imaging, it would have failed me because the patient came in with uh, bilateral leg weakness and uh, you know, almost like a kinetic mutism. So it just wasn't talking at all, wasn't following commands, very apathetic. And I don't have all the images here, but you can see here is a clot 
in the A1, A2 junction on the left side, and I scrolled up and down, you know, you could track out both ACAs, right? So I was like, dang it, you know, this has got to be the explanation for the patient's weakness and the uh, mutism because there was no other, there's no MC occlusion or anything. So I did the angio, and the ACA here was completely out. What I didn't appreciate on the CTA was that when I, after doing the thrombectomy, so here's the step retriever um, going from A1 into A2 and probably A3, is that this was the dominant A1 ACA and a hypoplastic on the other side, so it was supplying both ACAs. So immediately after thrombectomy, she started lifting her legs and talking. So it was a pretty impressive case, and so I just wanted to highlight that. Here's, um, you know, again, kind of outside the box. Do you have a comment? Yeah. Would you uh, <coughs> be able to see such a case on a CT perfusion at all? Yeah, so, you know, traditionally, um, we don't do CT perfusion. I do it, uh, you know. Uh, this is why I asked you to give this lecture. <laughs> yeah, so we did it uh, in instances, you know, when the Don trial was running, we would reserve it for those cases, potential candidates. But outside of trial thus far, you know, I have not routinely done CT perfusion. We have the rapid license now that the study is over. And so, you know, our aim is for any of those sort of borderline cases like that one, the ACA occlusions, perhaps a CT perfusion would have been helpful. Um, and you know, when in doubt, we just take the patient for a diagnostic angio, right? And if it's something where, you know, you feel like your clinical judgment tells you that, look, uh, there's gotta be an explanation for the, you know, clinical deficits, even if the CT perfusion tells me that you know, uh, the area uh, in the bilateral ACA territory, the perfusion is okay. Because I can check out vessels on both sides, colos marginal, all the way. So that was a confusing part. There was no evidence of hypoperfusion, at least by CTA collaterals, right? So I think it was a destructive case, and, you know, perhaps uh, the rapid would have been helpful in that setting, you know, to say, okay, I'm definitely going to take this patient. Um, this was an interesting case. This is a 61-year-old lady from last month, and uh, she present, had the weirdest presentation. And again, talking about you know doing perfusion, I'm not sure if it would have been helpful in this situation. <laughs> so this lady came in with ataxic hemiparesis. Okay, so she basically had a right P1 PCA occlusion, P1 P2 occlusion and just would not coordinate it in the left arm and left leg. If you asked her to lift arm, she could lift it, but if you do finger, nose, finger, she was all over the place and then had a drift. And she had visual neglect. She could see, okay? If you ask her how many fingers here, how many fingers here? But if you try to do double simultaneous stimulation visually, she would miss the left side of her field every time consistently. So I said, what the heck, you know? And so we got an MRI, in order, because the CT, you know, didn't show any infarct. CTA showed the P1 occlusion, so whenever I see a PC occlusion, I always get an MRI to make sure that the occipital lobe is not getting infarcted, you know, uh, and that there's still a chance to salvage, because I don't trust this pure, the plain CT for posterior circulation. So the MRI was pristine, and she consistently had these deficits, and my stroke schedule was a 10. Right. So, you know, what would you have done in this situation? <coughs> and here's the other thing on the MRA. So here's a PCOM here, right? So if you track this, trace this up and down, you can see the PCA on the left side all the way to the cortex. But on the right side, there was no evidence of perfusion, right? So the clot was distal to where the PCOM joint. So technically P2, is that a patient you would treat? Yes. Yeah, I, I think definitely. I mean, she has. So, so this is actually a perfect patient to treat because she has no core infarct right now by the MRI, and she has a big deficit. And then, uh, at least you know, to me, obviously, uh, uh, the trials are not out there because these patients are not that common. Yeah. But to me, you have a vessel that is occluded. 
and a large deficit and no core. So, uh, you know, going out to the uh, P2 with the sand shriver is not that much different than going into like a, you know, M1 and 2. So I think she's the perfect candidate for, for yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So um, here's the initial run. And I was hoping the cloud was more proximal, but it was, you know, P2 just around the bend. And so I said, all right, you know, uh, she had no risk factors for intracranial athro, like had. So I was hoping it would be, you know, just uh, pass through with a uh, wire and then get the scent retriever up. So you can see the scent retriever here. And I had the ACE positioned at the basilar apex. As I retrieved it, it went to the PCA and it just took everything out as a unit, single pass, and she had full reperfusion. On the MRI the next day, she had no occipital infarct. Her neglect resolved, her ataxic hemiparesis resolved. So this was a good learning case for all of us. This is only like probably my third PCA stroke. Had one where it was clear visual field cut. The guy couldn't see anything, and he was a musician. But, um, you know, this one had an odd presentation. So we end up getting more advanced imaging. Bridges, I have to interrupt because we will have to move out of here in about 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, let, <coughs> let me change. Yeah, I, mean, other I will show you a cover. case where a PCA is seen on a CT perfusion scan. Yeah, so, I don't have any beautiful images of perfusion, so if you okay. do, please. Yeah, I, I, I will show some. Okay. And I'll try, try to do it within 10 minutes because now really we will have to conclude it. Yeah, yeah, go for it. Um, do you guys have any questions about the. Um, data collection efforts. And any of you who wish to be, oh look, I have one actually. Let me just show this case real quick, I think you'll like this. Yeah, but we have to leave in 10 minutes. <laughs> it's nice. <laughs> okay, so this is just a quick one. Quick story. So this is a 55 year old, came in with aphasia, gaze the whole nine yards and oh ended up God. doing a CT perfusion because he had malignant profile on the CT scan, right? So I was like, man, am I gonna harm this patient even though CT aspects was 10? And so got this and I was like, well, the guy's young. If I don't do anything, he's screwed his dominant hemisphere. So I ended up doing uh, the thrombectomy, full reperfusion. This is his post-treatment MRI, right? So how many of you think that he did well. 55 year old, right? So the key thing here was, I'll skip the study, move quickly. So from picture to puncture, it was you know, 30, 35 minutes, okay? The guy, besides having aphasia, is walking around, okay? Because he spared his ACA territory, despite being a malignant profile, because he had reperfusion. So, you know, ICAT, Bad image, but have to be aggressive when the patients are young and have a lot to lose. I have my right. 